thank you all for uh, being here for our second lecture uh, of this calendar year. It's the uh, third of the academic school year for our Visiting Faculty Scholars of Color series. Uh, this series is really important to our school, and I would even argue important to the field of education. Um, the series started over 30 years ago um, at Michigan State University and traveled uh, with our former dean, Andy Baker, to the University of Wisconsin, then onward to Vanderbilt, and now here to Penn. Uh, this is our eighth year um, hosting the series here at Penn. Um, if one were to go back and trace the roster um, over the past 30 years, you'd be overwhelmed by the brilliance and the celebrity and um, just the sort of amazing star power that is on that roster of uh, visiting uh, scholars of color. Um, today is no different. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Cynthia Feliciano, who is on the faculty in sociology and uh, Chicano Latino studies at University of California, Irvine. Um, her research investigates the development and consequences of group boundaries and inequalities based on race, ethnicity, class, and gender. Uh, this work primarily, but not exclusively, focuses on how descendants of Latin American and Asian immigrants are incorporated in the United States. She pursues these issues through two main strands of research. The first uh, is determinants of educational inequity, which is why we have her here, uh, given the talk at the uh, Graduate School of Ed. And uh, she also uh, investigates this through ethnic and racial boundary making and relations. Professor Feliciano is author of the book, Unequal Origins, Immigrant Selection and the Education of the Second Generation. She also has published numerous articles in the very best uh, peer-reviewed sociology journals, including Social Problems, Social Forces, Sociology of Education, Demography, and Social Science Quarterly. Those really are very difficult journals to get in. So I think it is a real testament to uh, the quality of her work that she's published um, so routinely in those. I will say that when I went to meet her uh, this morning, I felt so badly that we had brought this Californian, um, <laughs> or at least what I presume to be a Californian, uh, here to the Northeast, um, and we didn't have better uh, weather for her. But then I discovered that she's actually a native New Yorker, um, <laughs> turned Californian. So she gets this, right? Yeah. Um, she's also lived in Boston. Um, Cynthia's <laughs> bachelor's degree is from Boston University and her PhD is from UCLA. Uh, she's been a Ford Foundation Fellow, she's been a uh, Spencer postdoc, and she also has received the uh, coveted uh, UC uh, President's Postdoctoral Fellowship. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Cynthia. Thank you so much, Sean, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you so much for having me and for this invitation and for being here for this talk. It's really wonderful to be here. Although I am a native New Yorker, um, this is actually my first time at the UPenn campus and I haven't spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, so it's nice to be out here despite the weather. Um, <clears throat> and excuse me as I'm talking, I have a little bit of a cold, so excuse my voice. Um, I'm also excited to give this talk. Uh, the title is Rethinking the Immigrant Paradox in Education. This work builds on some of my prior work, but it's um, really a new paper and a new project. So this is actually the first time I'm presenting it. So I'm eager to hear your thoughts and your questions and your comments. And this is collaborative work that I've been doing with my doctoral student, Yadar Lanuza, um, at UC Irvine. So um, we've been working on this and thinking through these ideas for some time, but it's still a work in progress. So I appreciate your comments. So um, I want to give a little bit about a background about why it's important to study um, children of immigrants within education. Um, and you, many of you probably already know this, but it's a huge important part of the population. So about currently about one in four American children live in immigrant families. So it's an important subpopulation. And of course, this number is a lot higher in particular locales, probably like Philadelphia, but especially like where I live in Southern California, it's 50% or higher when you go into schools, um, are children of immigrants. Um, and this is projected to grow to about one in three by the year 2040. Uh, so, yes. How are you defining immigrant families? Um, so those, this number is for those with at least one immigrant parent. Okay. First yes. generation. Um, well, the children, and I'll, I'm, right. 
um, that I'm looking at are actually what we call in, in sociological terms both the 1.5 generation, which would be those who migrated as children with their, um, usually with their families, but they grew up here um, largely going to American schools. So we call those the 1.5 generation. That's the term coined by my colleague, Ruben Rambao. Um, and the second generation. So those are US born children of immigrants with immigrant parents. And for this paper, we look at the true second generation, those with two immigrant parents. Or if there's only one parent that we have information on, we look at, um, we would consider them second generation as well. Um, and I look at the 1.5 generation as well. So because this is an important subpopulation, people have been studying uh, immigrant children's adaptation, and there's been debates about this. So the early debates, um, when people started studying this in the 90s, were concerned about um, decline, uh, what they called second generation de decline. So Herbert Gans referred to this, the possibility that children of immigrants might actually do worse than their parents in the American context. Um, Portes and Zhao's so segmented assimilation theory um, discuss the possibility of multiple different outcomes for different children, different groups of uh, immigrants' children. Um, but the one that got a lot of attention was the idea of downward assimilation. So again, similar to second generation decline, the idea that children of immigrants might do worse than their parents um, and not succeed. And largely this was um, thought because um, in the U.S. society now, you need a college education right, to succeed in, in, the, in the economy. So things have changed. There was an implicit comparison to descendants of European immigrants who were coming in a very different context where they could get uh, decent, you know, relatively high paying jobs without that education. So the concern was they don't get an education, they're not going to succeed. Newer work though found some results that many people thought were surprising. Um, they found based on a number of different outcomes that children of immigrants were actually doing better than children with native born parents. So this has been referred to alternately as the second generation advantage, also the immigrant advantage, um, the immigrant paradox or super achievement. And it's been considered paradoxical because the idea was people were surprised by this. Look at these immigrants coming to the United States. They should be disadvantaged, you would think. They're coming um, speaking different languages. They may have language difficulties in school. Their parents may not be able to communicate with their teachers, the administrators at school. They may not have the cultural knowledge about educational institutions, but yet they're doing better than those with native-born parents. So that's why it was considered a paradox. Why were people interested in this and thought, why is the immigrant paradox important? And I think there may be other reasons, but I think one of the main reasons is that people think if there is really a true immigrant or second generation advantage in education and they're doing better than their native-born peers, it suggests something detrimental about Americanization, like Americanization is detrimental to achievement. So in a recent edited volume about the immigrant paradox in, uh, in children and adolescents, um, Garcia Cole and Caravan Marx ask, is becoming American a developmental risk, right? So this is suggested there might be something really bad about American culture that we need to be concerned about if this true immigrant paradox is there, right? So what is the research said about this immigrant paradox in education or immigrant or second generation advantage? Well, largely the research has shown that the 1.5 and the second generation outperform the third generation in numerous educational outcomes. So people have looked at things like aspirations and expectations, GPA, test scores, and educational attainment, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, right? And which, you know, some might argue is really the important thing for looking at later economic incorporation in U.S. society, right? Um, so researchers have looked at this in a number of ways for different immigrant groups, and some of these findings may have only emerged for um, looking at some groups of immigrants' children versus others. People have debated about what the comparison gr group should be. Should it be uh, native-born children of native-born um, African-American parents for children of West Indian immigrants? Should it be you know, third generation whites? But largely the research has shown this immigrant advantage. But the big caveat is that usually this advantage only emerges when children of immigrants are compared with children, uh, to children of native boys with similar socioeconomic backgrounds. So, and, and I'll show this in a minute. So that's um, a big caveat that will be important to the argument that we're trying to make here. So some of the explanations that have been offered for the immigrant paradox. 
and these aren't mutually exclusive, um, but some are the idea of immigrant <coughs> optimism, excuse me. So um, Grace Cow, who's here at, at Penn in sociology, talks about immigrant optimism as a way to understand their findings in the research um, that the 1.5 and the second generation were doing better. Um, so this is the idea that immigrants are coming, they're coming to the United States often for opportunities for their children, right? So they have this optimism that their children can succeed here and their children, you know, in turn develop that optimism for themselves or in a work harder if you think that it's going to pay off, right? Whereas um, the implicit comparison is to some children of native born, and often the implicit comparison is children of native born minorities who might be disillusioned, you know, by the inequality in our society and think that even if they work hard, it might not pay it off. So related to that, the idea of the immigrant ethic, the idea that they're here to work and they're prepared to work hard. Um, so also related to these, we can think of these as cultural resources, right? So cultural resources in terms of expectations, high expectations that immigrant parents might have for their kids' success, right? Another cultural resource that has been talked about is um, children's language resources. So being able to speak more than one language has been shown to have benefits for schooling, right? So that might be another cultural resource that they have um, in addition to um, parents' high expectations, which the research has shown immigrant parents have. Um, but some of this um, also begs the question of where do these cultural resources come from? Where does this optimism come from? And really it's related to immigrant selectivity. And scholars have suggested, have suggested this. Um, scholars like Alba and Kassanitz and uh, Andrew Fulini have talked about immigrant selectivity. The fact that um, the immigrants that we're getting in the United States are not just some random sample of people who end up here. right? They are a select group of people who are deciding to migrate for their countries of origin. Most people do not leave the country that they were born in, right? Um, so even from our large ascending countries, most people stay in that stay in Mexico. They don't come here. So so how are those people different than the people who stay in their home country? Um, so people have talked about this and how this might be driving the immigrant optimism or the immigrant ethic, but it's difficult to capture that. Um, in terms of how can we actually measure that. So in my prior work, I measured this looking at the group level. So my prior work wasn't concerned with the immigrant paradox. It was a concern more with the question of why are some groups of um, particularly children of Asian immigrants doing better than children of Latin American immigrants in school? And so what I looked at was group level resources in terms of the selectivity of the group level of, um, of those immigrant groups and found that that largely explained the Asian second generation relative to um, second generation Latinos. Um, but that work um, was limited because I only looked at a group measure of selectivity, so I didn't look at what was happening within families and that there's actually variation among parents and how selective they are. Yes? Which Asian American communities did you look at um, for your study? So it was, um, for that study, it was, I looked at 32 different immigrant groups. I can't think of oh, all of them at the top of my head. But what, what um, I did for that study was looked at, so some of the groups in there were like Indians, Koreans, Chinese. Um, I looked at a measure of their selectivity of that group um, based on you know, when most of the migrants came from that country of origin. Right? Um, and I found that that explained these large pan-ethnic differences that we see among Asians generally and Latinos generally. And that's, um, obviously simplifying a lot of complexity there within these groups, but in general you do see most um, Asian immigrants are much more highly selective than most uh, Latin American immigrants. Um, but that work was only at the group level, it didn't look at um, immigrant parents specifically. Um, and um, it didn't, we didn't have a comparable, I didn't have a comparable measure for the third generation, so I really couldn't look at this question of why you know, 1.5 and second generation might be doing better than the third generation. So that's what um, we're doing here. Um, so here we're looking at an individual measure of immigrant selectivity, and we're thinking about this more broadly in terms of what we're um, calling contextual attainment. So contextual attainment, means placing parents' educational attainments within the geographic and historical context in which they were attained. So our idea is to problematize this idea of an immigrant paradox by rethinking our conceptualization of family class background. So we argue that parents' contextual attainment better captures broader dimensions of social class 
that matter for the intergenerational transmission of advantage or disadvantage. So from our view, placing parents' educational attainments within the geographic and historical context they were attained, this recognizes that uh, many different countries that immigrants come from have varying educational distributions that are very different and educational systems that are very different than we have here in the U.S. So in many countries, um, the norm, for instance, is to not go to secondary <coughs> school, especially the time that the immigrants came. Right? So in those contexts, maybe having a the equivalent of a high school diploma means something different than it might mean here in the U.S. context where going to high school, getting a high school diploma is, norm, is the norm and if that's all you get in the U.S. context, that's not really that great by our standards, right? Um, so from this view, children of immigrants come from higher class backgrounds on average than children of native born parents, right? So they're highly selective and we'll, we'll show this in a minute. Um, and this is related also to the idea that for some migrants, actually for many immigrant groups, they experience um, decline in status actually after migration. So this is sometimes been referred to as the status paradox of uh, migration because the people who are coming were of high status in the home country, but they come here and they experience downward ability in terms of their status. But we argue that that status prior to migration is important. Yes? I'm just curious, is it all immigrants or is it Well, I'm going to get to the results and, and you will see this. Um, so obviously it's not the case that every single you know, immigrant is more selective than the people left behind. There's some variation that I'll talk about. Um, and, and if it's still not clear, let me know, please. So why would contextual attainment matter? So most people only control for you know, parents' absolute levels of schooling or maybe their household income as characteristics of socioeconomic status. So why would contextual attainment matter? Um, so we argue that typical measures of SES don't capture this, that they are highly selective. And we argue that it would matter because the advantages of higher class background are often not just about economic resources or material resources. So we're not saying that doesn't matter at re material resources. I think it matters a lot. So of course if your parents are wealthy, can afford to send you to the college of your choice, that material resource is really important. But it's not the only thing that's important about coming from a higher class background. So a large literature in sociology talks about this, like the mechanisms through which um, class advantages get passed down to children. And those mechanisms are beyond economics. So there are things like um, the status attainment model talks about the social psychological mechanisms through which this happens. Parents having high aspirations, high expectations for their children, and their children internalizing that ambition for themselves. Right. Related to this is Bourdieu's work, which discusses um, habitus. The idea, um, generally speaking, the idea is about one's conception of where they fit in to the world. Um, and the idea that um, that conception for immigrants might be based on where they were situated prior to migration in their status system in their home country. Right. And that conception is associated with a set of dispositions um, that emerge from that and which are related to um, uh, sets of cultural and symbolic capital. So cultural capital um, being um, resources such as um, cultural styles that children might emulate from their parents. Um, another sociologist here at Penn, Annette Leroux, talks about cultural capital as important in the transmission of um, class advantage from middle class parents to their children. And we might see the same thing for immigrants' children. Um, symbolic capital being advantages associated with um, one's place in the status system, right? So their idea, just the symbolic idea of their status, they give them certain conceptions of where they fit in and where they sh their kids should fit in in this context. Right? So some of the ways those might get transmitted is through things like shared family narratives about parents talking about where they were, what their home country was like, who they were in their home country prior to migration. And those ideas might get trans tra uh, transmitted to the kids. Fernandez Kelly talks about this in some of her work um, as uh, the kids having this, immigrant kids having this as a sort of source of pride for them and a, and a source of dignity, um, often even in the face of sometimes facing discrimination in the schools or um, they still have that conception of themselves and that propels them to work hard. 
Class background also might matter because parents have a set of cognitive skills that they pass on to their kids. And I'm, uh, here I'm not talking about anything like genetic passing on. I'm talking about learning that goes on in the home. Um, and so um, Raymond Burial talks about um, how in Mexico, um, the same level of education uh, in Mexico versus here, like a middle school education, they're actually learning a lot more at that time in the schooling because they're preparing kids to go into the labor market, not preparing them to go to high school, right? So what they're actually, the level of what they're learning, um, my co-author, um, Yather, talks about that because he's an immigrant himself who came in middle school from Nicaragua and he said when he got to the schools here, they were learning stuff he had learned like last year or the year before, right? So the, the level of what the parents have learned with a, say, sixth grade education might be very different from what you've learned with a sixth grade education here in the U.S. Um, and you can pass those cognitive skills on to your kids. So with that in mind, the research questions we're looking at. So is there an immigrant or second generation advantage in educational attainment? I've already shown you the research shows generally, but um, I want to show it with our data set as well. And when is it actually evident for what particular groups? Is it evident controlling for SES or not? And does considering contextual attainment help explain the immigrant paradox, help explain this um, advantage? We also talk about how contextual attainment differs from absolute levels of educational attainment and SES, and how it differs both within and between countries of origin. And finally, we're going to consider whether or how our understanding of intergenerational educational mobility changes when contextual attainment is considered. So does our understanding of intergenerational uh, class reproduction or upward mobility or downward mobility shift when we think of immigrants' parents' starting points in different ways? So the data we use for this paper, um, the main data source is the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. Uh, commonly known as, as Ad Health. Um, this is a good data source for this because it's nationally representative. It's a large sample it includes, and it includes information on parents' place of birth, which was key for us and to be able to identify the second generation. The study was done in four waves. So the first wave in 1994-95, um, they were adolescents from 7th to 12th grade. It was a school-based um, sample. And then the last wave, um, the most recent wave that's available, there's actually been a follow-up since then, was um, in 2008, and the respondents were ages 26 to 32. So that's the, out, um, the um, our outcome, which is years of schooling completed, is measured at that time. And our sample size for um, our study is about a little over 9,000. So Ad Health originally started with um, over 20,000 adolescents. There's been attrition over time, and there's um, a set of weights that you have to use to account for that differential attrition. So we include um, only cases that have valid weights, and we also use multiple imputation to deal with um, missing, missing data. And combined with this data, we use data from the Barrow Lee Study of Educational Attainment. So this is um, a really large uh, data collection effort where they actually just put together um, data on the educational distributions across a number of different countries for different, um, by gender and for different age cohorts and different time periods. So they've actually compiled in one place all this data from different censuses and surveys from a number of different immigrant sending countries that we draw on to create our measure. So our measure of contextual or relative educational attainment tries to capture each parent's place in their country of origin's educational distribution at the approximate time of migration, based on age and gender. And it's calculated as a percentile. So you can think of it similar to what you think of um, percentiles in like GRE scores or SAT scores. Um, so, the per so it's based on the percent of people who have less education than the respondent, um, plus 50% with equal educational attainment. So as an example, if we had an immigrant father who completed secondary school from, say, country A, he came to the U.S. around 1980 at age 32. <clears throat> this is the distribution in their country of origin. So in that, in that country, 15% um, of the population had no schooling, 25% had um, some primary schooling, 
30% completed primary, 15% had some secondary schooling, and only 10% had completed secondary schooling in that country. So we take half of that 10% and add all these, and he's actually at the 80, about the 85th percentile for educational attainment in the, his origin uh, country. So, and we use this measure based on, um, because we're connecting it to the, to the children, based on the parent with the highest relative educational attainment. I keep getting stuck on that. Um, so just to show country variations to kind of illustrate um, this idea of contextual attainment and the importance of contextualizing education. So these are the cumulative educational distributions in three countries. This is just for women in 1980 in this age range. But you see, I just want to focus on um, people who have some secondary schooling, so they haven't even completed uh, the equivalent of high school here in the U.S. You can see that for um, women who are here in the U.S. context, they were about the 10th percentile, right? So that's not very highly educated by U.S. standards. 90% of the population is more educated than them. But if you were in the Philippines, for these women, they're pretty highly educated. They're at the 68th percentile. And if you're in Mexico, you're even more highly educated with that level of schooling. You're at the 90th percentile. So you can see these vast country differences. There's also variation, though, within um, origin countries. So this is what I hope will address your question that you had. Um, so here, these are for the immigrant parents in our sample. So I just selected um, three um, samples. So these are East Asian immigrant parents. And you can see for them that this is a very, very highly selected immigrant group, right? That most of them are over here. So the, this is the 50th percentile. So we can think of it, the people who are to the right are positively selected with respect to education. People to the left are negatively selected. They're less educated than people. And there's a few people down here, but mostly it's a story of high positive selection. But you can see there's also some variation um, among the parents in our sample. Um, for the Cuban immigrants, it's also a story of very high positive selectivity, but, it, but even more variation. So there's immigrant parents who aren't all coming from the top end of the distribution. There's variation. Some are even negatively selected. And in the Mexican case, you can see that, again, the story is overwhelmingly positive selection. They're, they're above that 50th percentile, but they're not as highly selected as these groups. And more of them are kind of at the low end of positive selectivity, so more at the 50th, 60th percentile than you see for the other groups. And this is just for comparison, US-born white parents. So to be replicated using the US context for US-born white parents, and you can see they're, they're across the distribution, so, as you so would expect. Uh, mm -hmm. A country like India, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what would that look like? They'd look like this. <laughs> so, so we have a very small number of, of um, Indians in this sample, so we can't pull them out. Um, we do have a category, and you'll see I'll talk about later, called Other Asians, which are largely Indians. And you'll see their, their, um, their educational attainment is really, really high, um, and largely because of that. In my other work, where I looked at the group level of the 32 different countries, they were actually the highest selected immigrant group when you look at it at the group level. Um, so generally, yes. So, but these are East Asian immigrant parents, so like parents from uh, China, Korea, Japan. So other independent variables um, that we look at, I'll try to go through this um, quickly in the interest of time. Uh, I talk, already talked about how we measure generation. Um, we look at 1.5 second and third generation, or third plus generation, I'd say. We can't distinguish among that. Um, we look at parental years of schooling completed, so just in absolute terms. And we, again, we take the highest, the parent with the highest level of schooling. Um, and family household income, and again, this is from when the respondents were adolescents, right? What their family um, background was like at that time. We control for age, sex, and some of the models. Um, we control for race or origin. So to move on to our findings. So this is just in terms of the outcome we are looking at, years of schooling completed, how it varies by immigrant generation. And so what you see is quite, I think, kind of underwhelming, right? There's not a huge, there's not much that going on here. The 1.5 generation look like they have slightly more years of schooling than the third generation, but these differences are actually not significant differences. So overall, there's no immigrant paradox in educational attainment if you just look at it descriptively. 
So when does it emerge? When we see it emerge when we look at it in statistical models controlling for parent socioeconomic status. So this model controls for demographic, so it controls for age, sex, um, race, and um, parents' um, incomes when they were adolescents and uh, parents' absolute years of schooling completed. And so here you do see this immigrant second generation advantage. So they are um, the 1.5 generation in particular, uh, much more likely get, uh, get uh, almost a year more schooling when we create this kind of hypothetical scenario that their family backgrounds were similar. Um, and what's driving this is the SES, the demographics don't really change anything. Um, and the second generation we see it are advantaged as well, right? Relative. So this is what um, a lot of the literature has reported, this kind of finding, right? Um, but what happens when we consider the parents' education contextually? When we consider that, we see a lot of these differences are explained. So there's no second generation advantage. This, this difference is not significant. There still is a slight um, 1.5 generation advantage relative to the third generation, but a lot is explained. So 50% of that um, advantage that the 1.5 generation seemed to have when we controlled for just the typical measures of SES are explained when we add contextual attainment. But this analysis, of course, lumps together all 1.5 second, third generation groups. So we wanted to look at it um, in a more nuanced way. So we looked at a number of different groups. I'm just going to present some of the uh, group uh, descriptives here, and I'll just focus on some. So in the top, I included the third generation whites. So this column is just the years of schooling that they complete on average. This is their family's household income. This is actually logged income. Um, this is their highest parents' years of schooling. Um, this is putting that highest years of schooling in the U.S. context. So you see um, white parents are above average. They're at the 57th percentile in the U.S. context. And this is in the home country context, which is about the same for third generation whites. So I just want to point to some examples. So these are the 1.5 and second generation East Asian. And we put these together. We ended up with, I, don't, I couldn't fit all of them on this slide, 13 different immigrant groups um, based on collapsing, based on sample sizes that were large enough to look at. So these are uh, important because they have the highest educational attainment of any of the groups that we look at, um, over averaging 16 years of schooling. Right? Um, so that's just descriptively. So they are doing better. right? And then if you look at their household incomes, they're actually slightly below those of third generation whites. Um, so this is where people think about this as kind of paradoxical that they're doing so well. But their parents' education is about the same as it is for whites. So this is a highly educated group by pretty much any standards, at least on average. But if you look at that parents' education in the home country context, they were on average at the 89th percentile. So very highly selected immigrant group, and you really see um, how highly selected. Um, a couple of other examples I wanted to point to, Southeast Asians. So these are uh, children of immigrants from mostly Vietnam, but also Cambodia, Laos. Um, and they've been pointed to in the literature because they're doing pretty well. They're, they're about averaging the same as their generation whites, despite coming from really low socioeconomic backgrounds. So their household incomes were very low. Their parents' level of schooling, averaging 11 years, is only about the 39th percentile in the U.S. context, very low. But they're a very highly selected immigrant group. Um, and even Mexicans who are doing, um, this is the second generation, who are not doing well overall relative to third generation whites, and they come from low SES, so you might predict that based on that. But they are pretty highly selected still. The, the parents were on average at the 75th percentile. So what we did was um, ran regression models for years of schooling completed, um, comparing across models. So this first model just accounts for the demographic, sex, and age. And what we see here, I highlight in yellow, that there are four of these 13 groups that actually do show an immigrant or second generation advantage just descriptively. Um, East Asians, other Asians, um, 1.5 generation Filipinos, and 1.5 generation Cubans. So these are all doing better relative to third generation whites. Um, and these two groups, so most of them, you don't see a difference actually at all descriptively. These two groups, 1.5 and second generation Central and South Americans, 
and um, other Latinos are actually doing worse than third generation right, whites. But what happens when you control for parental years of schooling and household incomes, you see, this is where you really see that immigrant paradox and that immigrant and second generation advantage emerge. And so for 10 out of the 13 groups that we look at, they actually are advantaged relative to third generation whites. So including um, groups like 1.5 and second generation Mexicans, which we tend not to think of as you know, highly successful um, groups in terms of education, but when you control for their parents and their family um, class background, at least in these terms, they actually are advantaged, right? And so this is what people are saying is really paradoxical why we see this. Um, and for these other groups, you see for East Asians, just controlling for these, the advantage just grows even more. It does explain it a bit for the other Asians. So in the third model, we include that measure of parents' contextual attainment. And what we see is that for seven out of the 10 groups that had an advantage, it's completely explained by this parents' contextual education. So thinking about their class background more broadly. Um, for three of the groups, we still see that advantage remain, but it declines significantly. So it declines by about 20% for the 1.5 second generation East Asians and about 30% for other Asians and for Cubans. But the story is largely that um, a lot of these, this advantage and this so-called paradox is explained when you include a, uh, a measure of contextual attainment that captures class background more broadly than most scholars have been, have been doing. And you can also see, um, like circled here, that it is a highly significant positive predictor of educational attainment. So with that in mind, I want to return to the descriptive findings um, after suggesting that there really is no immigrant paradox, what should we include this more nuanced uh, measure of class background, um, to the question of intergenerational educational mobility, meaning, meaning going from what parents were parents' class background is to the kids' background in terms of educational attainments. Um, and what we see when we look at it, um, this is from the perspective that most scholars have looked at this question on the left. So on the left, and I just took out some uh, exemplary groups just to show you. So these are third generation whites. So these are the parents and where they were situated in the US context. So they're, this is 50th percentile is the median. So they're above that. And their kids remain above that. It's pretty much a story of class reproduction, the kids reproducing the same position that their parents um, were in. Now keep in mind, in absolute terms, the kids are actually more educated because our society has become more educated generationally, right? Um, but if you put their parents in relative terms and their kids in relative terms, they're about reproducing it. The same with uh, blacks, third generation blacks. They're reproducing their parents' position of our educational hierarchy. Um, pretty much on average, but in this case, it's below the median, right? Um, now, for immigrant groups, what you see is different. You see what looks like incredible upward mobility, right? Their parents, these are um, 1.5 and second generation East Asian immigrant parents. They're actually highly educated, so they're above, you know, they're almost as educated as their generation whites, but their kids are way up here doing much better than than uh, the average in the US context. And even if you look at groups that are not that educated, so these are the um, Southeast Asians that I referenced before, their parents by our standards are pretty not that educated, right? Less than the 40th percentile, but their kids are doing really well, better than third generation whites. Um, and then even second generation Mexicans. So if you think about it in this terms, their parents are way down here. They're about the 17th percentile in education by US standards. But the kids are over here. So yeah, they're, they're about the 42nd percentile. So they're not doing that well in terms of educational attainment in the US. But many people have said, well, look at how far they came. Right? So some people have even referred to the, the Mexican immigrant groups as the most successful immigrant group because when you look at it this way, it looks like incredible education and mobility. They just started from so low. But these measures for the immigrant groups don't contextualize the education from the country that was actually attained in. So when you look at it from that perspective and contextualize the parents' education, it looks quite different. It doesn't look any different for the native-born groups. But it looks a little different for the immigrant groups. So these are the um, East Asians. So you see what you see is more like a class reproduction story, more like 
the immigrant kids uh, may be regressing a little bit to the mean, but doing, doing very well, but maybe not being so surprising that they're doing well. Look at how highly selected their parents were. If you look at the Southeast Asians, again, their parents were highly, highly selected, even though they have you know, low uh, socioeconomic status in the US context, their pre-migration was higher. And their kids, you know, it looks like almost downward ability, except I would keep in mind, they're still above the 50th percentile, so they're doing pretty well. Um, and then the Mexican case, from this perspective, it's hard to argue that they're the most successful immigrant group, right? Because their parents were actually pretty highly educated in their home country, and the kids are not doing very well by our standards, right? So that might be a, a cause for concern. So it's a different way to think about uh, educational mobility from parents to children when we think about it um, and contextualize where that education was attained. So to summarize some of the key findings, is there an immigrant paradox in education? Well, a few groups of immigrants' children do better than the third generation whites overall, but mostly the paradox emerges with controls for typical measures of socioeconomic status. Parents' contextual attainment helps explain the immigrant advantage that emerges with controls for typical measures of SES. Um, and we also show that contextual attainment differs from absolute educational attainment, and it varies both between and within countries of origin. Finally, we show that our understanding of intergenerational educational mobility shifts depending upon how and whether parents' educational attainments are contextualized especially for immigrants and their children. And I should say even contextualizing um, education at all for anyone um, reveals this. So many people talk about, well, their parents didn't graduate high school, but they graduated high school. But even looking at that intergenerationally, we have our, our um, educational system has changed over time, right? And we see this um, at, in regards to, for example, Obama's proposal to, to offer two years of, of college schooling to everyone. That's a recognition that the meaning of a high school diploma is not the same as it was 50 years ago, right, in the US context. So what are the implications? So I didn't talk about these arguments, but the, the findings can, um, I think, challenge some essentialist cultural explanations for some immigrant group success. So essentialist cultural explanations, I'm talking about things like Amy Chua's work that many of you may have heard of getting a lot of media attention. The idea that these groups have these cultural traits, and that's why explaining why they're doing so well. And we're showing, well, if you look at class background, that actually explains it so you don't need to you know, talk about these essentialist cultural traits. It's not saying that there aren't some mechanisms through which culture works here, but ultimately it's, it's a, a structural position in the home country that can explain the, these great success stories. Right? Contextual attainment helps capture non-economic benefits of family class background. And so we would argue, particularly for immigrant groups, it captures these non-economic benefits better than typical measures of, of SES do. And again, the non-economic benefits being things like um, cultural and symbolic capital, habitus, aspirations, expectations, and all those mechanisms through which class background um, of parents matters for their children's attainment. And so we suggest thinking about this um, not only in terms of immigrant groups, but thinking about a broader view of educational attainment in general and the importance of placing educational attainment in context. Um, so we can think of um, questions for future research that might look at contextual attainment, for example, even in the United States, and think about questions such as, does contextual attainment maybe better explain labor market outcomes um, if we're thinking about historical changes and the connection between education and labor market outcomes, um, for example. So while contextual attainment matters, especially for immigrants who come from countries with vastly different educational systems and opportunities, Contextual attainment might also aid in understanding inequality in more general terms in the US, um, and particularly the intergenerational transfer of um, advantage or disadvantage from parents to their children. Um, and I will stop there and take questions. Thank you. So we have roughly 30 minutes for questions. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my name is Marlon. I am a person in the industry. Um, so I have a couple of questions. First, a quick 
question about uh, what you mean, or educational attainment. So do, are you including um, like technical institutes as a level of education? So like, you know, for mechanical work or any kind of vocational uh, technical work like that? And if you are, would that be counted like two years of that mm -hmm. be the same as like an associate's degree at a mm -hmm. community college? Um, yeah. And uh, second, I'm wondering if you're at all making a distinction between this advantage, this immigrant advantage, and people using that advantage. Um, so, like, and this, I think, could uh, be captured within one family where it has a family has multiple children and one child att attains mm -hmm. a much higher level of education than another child and how is that explained when mm -hmm. the, the parents are have, are the same mm -hmm. um, and if that's considered at all or if that's separate from your findings that's those are great questions so um, we are using a pretty crude measure of our outcome, which is years of schooling completed, so to get at your first question. Um, so we did consider like those, um, and I have to go back and see exactly how it's coded, so I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but my recollection is that something like those vocational, that extra training, would they would be somewhere about 13 years of schooling, whereas an associate's degree, we count it as like 14 years of schooling. So, but again, it doesn't, um, our goal here was to look at broad patterns, so we're looking at, you know, kind of the broadest measure of educational attainment that doesn't necessarily go into all those fine-tuned distinctions, which are important, but it's not the focus of, of this study. Um, so the second question you had about was, was I think, if I could paraphrase about variation within families, right, in educational outcomes, um, which is a really great question and something we don't look at here. Um, interesting because that's the, actually the focus of um, my collaborator, Yad Lanuza's um, dissertation. So he, he's interested in that kind of variation. So that's beyond you know, the scope of this uh, study because we're interested in, um, it's again, so it's masking that some of the like heterogeneity that's being masked by just looking at parents and, you know, um, and their relationship to kids, right, in this kind of quantitative way. Um, but there is that variation. He's arguing that um, in his work, finding that certain um, kids within families, and I'm probably not doing it justice, but um, take on different roles in immigrant families. So some kids for education will get that, will be able to take advantage of those, uh, of those resources that they have in the family more than others um, because of certain uh, things associated within uh, with migration itself. So some kids take on the role of being the language broker, you know, in the family. And some kids take on the role of helping their siblings, right, with their homework. And some kids take on the role of going out into the workforce, right. And um, so those kind of um, differences, I think, are important. And I think uh, um, that's why his dissertation is important, because it's looking at that variation in that, um, within immigrant families and how that kind of varies from maybe native-born families, because I think you might find more differences among siblings in their outcomes among immigrant families based on things like age and migration and, and the different roles that they take on. Um, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this, which is just looking at, you know, in general, parents' education and how it relates to their kids' outcomes. But the questions? Yes? So um, thank you for sharing this work. It's really great, really interesting work. I really appreciate the challenge to extension of narratives. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It's really good stuff. Um, I just have a, a question that's kind of pushing you a little bit beyond your data, not a little bit, but very much so beyond your data. Um, and it's a question of wealth. I mean, we know from Dalton Connolly's work and others that wealth matters when it comes to educational attainment, especially in the US. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, granted, I, from what I recall at health, I think the most you get is like medium. Um, the amount of uh, house value, mm -hmm. that's about as much as you get as a measure of wealth and I hope there may be more I think, that I'm forgetting, but I'm wondering though, I mean, do you think that that might actually matter here? To what extent might it matter? To what extent might it shift the narrative? Um, or it reinforce the narrative even mm -hmm. more? That's a good question and something, I mean, something we can look at. Again, I'm not sure what the ad health, how far we can go 
with that. Um, if it does include a measure, like you say, of like property value, and how we might be able to include that, because and that's sometimes included, you know, in as kind of a typical measure of socioeconomic status. So that would be good. I mean, if our if our argument holds, we would expect that that's still not going to explain. Um, what we're seeing if we don't consider contextual attainment under their immigrants' you know, pre-migration status. But it's something definitely we can look at that I think would buttress our findings even more if it, you know, still, if it doesn't really make a difference. But thank you. Yes. Um, so I really enjoyed this because you know I am the second generation person that you're talking about. Um, so it's like, yeah, that's me. Um, but what I think might actually shift the narrative or something to take into consideration is the documented status yeah. of these individuals mm -hmm. because because of the wealth and because of the availability availability of jobs it just I just I think it can really drastically change but I don't know if you have the power and I don't think that you ask if they're documented in absolutely not yeah. so that would be a challenge yeah and I don't know if you're referring to legal status obviously is incredibly yes, important really and I don't know if you're referring to the parents or the kids' legal status, both. both are really important, right? And we don't have data on that, yeah. um, unfortunately. But yeah, for I mean, for the parents, that's going to be a huge barrier. And part of that will be captured by, you know, measures like household income because the jobs they can get um, are going to be less paying, lower paying jobs um, for the parents. But for the kids, like the one, since we include the 1.5 generation, this is hugely important because you'd imagine that. You know, if you don't have papers and you're, yeah. you can't get financial aid to go to college, you're unlikely to go if you're from a low family, which the undocumented generally are. Um, so that's very important, and that's part of, I um, think, why some of these findings have been considered really paradoxical, because it's even for the 1.5 generation, mm -hmm. um, even for the 1.5 generation Mexicans, in our case, where you see um, them doing better in terms of educational attainment than third generation whites once you control for family background. And we don't have a control for legal status. I'm sure if we did, we would see you know, differentiated differ uh, differences there based on whether they are, you know, have legal status or not. Um, but that's why this is considered even you know, more of a paradox when you consider for the 1.5 generation that some of them don't even have papers. Um, and it's hard, but generally, I mean, the research has shown, as you might expect, that those who don't have papers do have lower educational attainment. Of course, there's huge barriers to overcome. What is surprising is the number who persist and, and do well and go on to college despite you know, that huge barrier. Um, but it's something, unfortunately, that we just can't look at with this, with this data. Yeah. I think this builds off this a little bit, but it's, as a qualitative researcher, who's always interested in looking at singularity, you know, of both specific individuals or families or communities, and then to juxtapose it next to, you know, a measure like this, which yeah. is really fascinating. I want to reiterate that first implication is just so important. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about even my grandfather was a migrant worker from the Philippines at a certain time, and the experience of that generation is very different than some more recent immigrants, you know, who come over with a much higher education level. Um, but even when you, when you just said, like, um, you know, it's even beyond, like, um, having papers or not. Like, we work with one community here who um, are essentially stateless, you know, um, people, right? So that they left their home country because of sectarian violence, right? Um, but then once they got here, because they were from a predominantly Muslim country, they've been targeted by mm -hmm. immigration and ICE. And it has, it's, you know, but their families, I think, have a high level of education in their mm -hmm. home country, right? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, like, education is, almost becomes in their imagination like a type of state. Mm -hmm. If you define state as like a safe place, mm -hmm. because there is no mm -hmm. safe space, either back home or here. Mm -hmm. So there's this, it's not even immigrant optimism, it's like survival. There's mm -hmm. this hope that if you get an education, there's a the possibility of kind of, mm -hmm. and I just, yeah, I mean, so like you, you think of so many, you know, as a qualitative researcher, you think of so many exceptions within families, within individuals, you know, within different communities, within broad categories, you know? And I just wonder, um, any thoughts you have about how we might move forward and bring together, you know, kind of the fine-grained look 
an emphasis on singularity and qualitative research, which is the really important work, you know, that you're doing here. And just, yeah, any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And it sounds like, I mean, it's you're we're talking about this example of these uh, Muslim families that they're still, they're kind of clinging to still that education in that home country a little yeah. bit, like for survival, and I think like the only thing that they have yeah. going for them almost. So it kind of resonates a bit, I think, yeah. with fine and with this very, you know, broad brush strokes of the kind of work I'm doing here. So I always like to hear about the qualitative cases because I can use those as kind of examples to kind of explain the mechanisms through which you actually see this on the ground. But of course, in cases like that, you know, the other, you know, issues regarding the context of reception they're facing here, right, yeah. is so overwhelming that they may not, you know, succeed. Um, despite advantages in terms of educate pre yeah. education, yeah. right? Yeah. And so um, we're certainly not, you know, trying to argue that those things don't matter. They of course matter, and you can look at um, individual cases to 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 understand that. I think the challenge for qualitative research is still trying to glean patterns, right, based on all these nuanced stories. So I have another project that I'm working on that does use more qualitative data. It's actually a follow-up to, um, if any of you have heard of the Children of Immigrants Longitudinal Survey. So I'm working with Ruben Rambao, my colleague in sociology at UCI, on a follow-up to that. So these um, kids were followed, um, were first interviewed as adolescents in San Diego, and then they were um, interviewed sus subsequently two more times after that. The last time was a qualitative interview, and so we're following up with that subsample. Um, and we've just um, almost completed the qualitative interviews for that. And they're now in their um, late 30s, so we can really see trajectories over 20 years and where they ended up. And the stories are fascinating because of all the twists and turns and all the different, you know, you can look at one person's narrative and kind of clean, well, this is what mattered for them and something different for someone else. So that's the challenge of me thinking now about how to analyze that data when I, you know, I'm, uh, more of my work is doing this kind of thing where you can, you know, have a huge sample yeah. and see the huge things because all those things what matter. What I notice in those narratives is also the cost of education um, for families. You mean the financial cost? I don't know the degree to which people, um, it could be financial, but it could also be just like when people feel like they have to compromise mm -hmm. values or right. connections or not see grandparents, you know. Uh -huh. um, I mean, there could be all sorts of costs also that come with that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and success. all the complex yeah. decision making that goes into yeah. whether someone goes on to college. I mean, and the most of the stories are yeah. not, with the reason we really want to do this follow up, because the last follow up they were in their mid 20s, and half, over half of them were still in school in some form or another. So we wanted to see what really happened to them. And what you see is that they could have gone in any different direction. Someone that interviewed and we thought, they're at a four-year college, they're going to graduate, and then something happened yeah, oh no. with their family, yeah, for instance, and they left, you know, because um, their mother passed away and exactly. they had to pay for the funeral, and then they just didn't, you know, have it in them to go back, and, and they never ended up getting a degree, and so it, it kind of shows the complexity in all these um, stories in people's lives and all the things, you know, that matter. So the, the struggle is how do you make sense of it in a larger way, and I'm struggling with that now with this this other study. So I'm interested in like, what role of geography you find in play. Because I think in Raj Chen's work, where he should show that. So he's in Congress with Harvard. He looks at residential segregation mm -hmm. as predicting social mobility. Mm -hmm. And he has a series of fascinating maps that compare communities of similar uh, graphics and size, and then looks at the degree of residential segregation in those cities mm -hmm. and how it predicts a lot of the same outcomes we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and he actually, one of the questions was, does this have anything to do with immigration? Because some of the places that we look at mm -hmm. are robust to immigration status. Um, so I'd be interested, again, within certain communities, are there different patterns? So where people actually move to? Are there more against the resources related to poor communities, the very similar communities, mm -hmm. that support some of these outcomes? Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a different residential pattern. It would be really interesting to look at this. That. Yeah, that's a really, um, really great question, really interesting. And I think that's important because I think that also has to do with some of the variation we see, I mean, which I glossed over, but 
some of these immigrant groups still doing extremely well, right? And some of the um, some of where that might come from is resources within their communities, right? That are geographically based. So Min Jo's work, for instance, talks about um, systems of supplemental education, right? For that Korean and Chinese youth have in their immigrant neighborhoods. There's if you go in these immigrant neighborhoods in Monterey Park, for instance, in near LA you will see all these like tutoring centers everywhere. And they're, they're ethnic based and they're in the neighborhoods and the kids have access to them. And that I think partly explains why they're doing even better you know, than you might expect um, based on just their family background, right? Even including my you know, armature here. So I think that's definitely the resources in the neighborhood, you know, and you juxtapose that compared to say, um, a Mexican case in the neighborhoods, you know, in Santa Ana, right, or where I live, and the resources there, you just don't see that, that kind of thing, you know. And in addition to neighborhoods, um, schools are neighborhood-based, right. Right? right? So the quality of the schools right. matter. Yeah, so I think that's really important and why you see, you know, as I um, showed here, like I think, you know, you really need to look at and not think of this, um, Mexican cases is one of great, how great they're doing, right? I think this is something we need to really think about, you know, what are the reasons why they're, you know, not getting um, the levels of educational attainment that are even average in, in the U.S. society. Thank you. Yeah, and so then another benefit, I think, of doing some of the uh, quality of work around sort of that geography piece, and I think of myself, I was mentioning this to you earlier as an immigrant, my first five years here, I lived in like a really rich immigrant neighborhood, um, just filled with lots of people who were new here. And the school system might, might not have been as great, but a lot of that out of school learning really sort of can be quite a support. Mm -hmm. that there, there was no point at that time where I was really questioning what it meant to not be American. Mm -hmm. And that didn't really happen until my parents moved us to a really good school mm -hmm. area where um, my brothers and I had mostly like, we were in communities that were mostly white. And, uh, so all those questions were happening then, but the quality of our lives <coughs> were really affected by those experiences of starting to have to tackle some of those really difficult questions. And so um, one thing that uh, that doing that kind of quality of sort of um, how kids are situated is that it can sort of also answer those questions about what the out of school, not just sort of like the tutoring support, but also out of school neighborhood kinds of support mm -hmm. of sort of interacting with people who are um, from where there's something that might already be there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I actually want to pick up on a piece of what Mel just said and um, certainly reinforce um, some compliments from uh, two of my faculty colleagues about that first implication mm -hmm. about moving us beyond essentialist narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, so when Mel was talking and she said that they first lived in, um, I'm paraphrasing, but um, sort of a, a rich or wealthy uh, immigrant. Oh, I didn't mean wealthy, I meant like filled with immigrants. Culturally rich. Culturally rich, yes. <laughs> Not really but, wealthy, every place but. Is <laughs> but, but even that, I think, I, I think fits very well with this question, right, about um, narratives mm -hmm. concerning uh, immigrants and children of immigrants, right? So um, it's a question about the utility of these amazing findings mm -hmm. that you have. I'm so inspired by them. And I really appreciate the nuance mm -hmm. and the complexity that you've brought to this. So how might we use what you found here to uh, move us beyond sort of one-sided narratives of um, Asian and uh, Latino immigrant families? Thank you for that. Um, it's, so it's nice to hear, because this is a work in progress, what's resonating with the audience and then this idea that it's challenging these essentialist cultural explanations because I, um, as a scholar, I just think, well, who believes that <laughs> anyway? But <laughs> then you see the, what's getting, what gets play in terms of what books are written and what in the media, and it's people like really like to hear about these essentialist cultural narratives, right? And so the challenge, I think, for me is to change that conversation a little bit, and I hope that this can contribute to that when you know we actually get it out there. Um, but it's really hard to do because, of, you know, um, I mean, I haven't presented this paper, but other work that, I, that I've done that also I think does that, challenges that, 
you sometimes get pushback from people who have that, those ideas so ingrained. This idea that my parents came with nothing. We had nothing. We had no advantages. And look how well we did. And why can't they do it? You know, they were born here and raised here. And, you know, that people really cling to that. And so I don't know that I have a great answer for you. Can I push a, a little bit, yeah. right? So you will <coughs> submit this paper to one of those top sociology <laughs> journals and it will get accepted for sure. Yeah. What can you do, though, beyond the paper, beyond publishing the paper? Um, I don't, I mean, I think the media attention, but I don't know, I mean, I, that's something where I don't know how you get, how you get the media attention because, again, there's this, certain things get media attention because they, they make arguments that people really want to believe. So I don't, I mean, I wish I had a, an answer, except that's my answer is that you try to get it out there. So you try to get it out there, you disseminate it to your communications people and they send it to, you know, and hopefully it will, you know, pick up some, some traction in that way to create this kind of counter. My, my push here was certainly a real compliment to uh -huh. the work because I just think, if we could hear so, if we could hear much more about this, it would just be so helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could push people mm -hmm. to be more thoughtful mm -hmm. and to be uh, more appreciative mm -hmm. of, uh, of of context, mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. that would be really Thank useful. You. I just, yeah. you know, so any suggestions <laughs> on that? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I just want to add to what Sean's saying. I mean, who believes this stuff? But you know, when when I'm sitting on admissions committees. For, to let in doctoral students. And there's the presumption that, you know, we don't need to diversify Asian America, you know. And, you know, um, I mean, to have a much more contextual look, for example, like, do we have students of, from Philadelphia of Cambodian background, you know, mm -hmm. in our institution? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and I mean, just the way we sometimes hom homogenize experience mm -hmm. across all groups we need at every level, if we're genuinely concerned with equity, equity exactly what you're arguing for, this more kind of contextualized look at human beings, yeah. you know, and And I think the findings, I mean, can, that this idea, general idea, can be applied to things like, how do we look at an applicant, exactly. for instance, who comes from Inglewood High School that offers, you know, two AP courses, and they take them all, and they have like a 4.0 or 4, well, versus, you know, the applicant from, Uni High, or just a high school by where I live, where there's like 25, you know, or something AP courses, and they, you know, they just, well, how do you put that in context, even what they're, what they're doing in high school in the context in which, you know, it, it matters, you know, and so some people don't, you know, look at it very differently, but I would look at, you know, the students who's doing the best that they can in the context that they, they are in, it's really impressive. And, uh, not everyone looks at it that way. So the, the challenge is to try to push that. So it's not forward. just in you know, the media, it's like right every yes. day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Yes. Not only that, questions. back to uh, Dr. Harper's <laughs> pushback, I just wondered also what kind of work you've done with school districts around your area. I mean, coming from the Philadelphia School District, knowing this what th that that graphic that you had there is is pretty graphic you know with the colors and everything just on the ground level staff of a bit the, your frontline people who are right at the office doing admissions secretaries who are a huge component of a school district like Philadelphia mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the relationship that Dr. Grossman was saying yesterday about that we'd like to make more with Penn and the school district you know that seems like some really great avenues to really make this very, very public rather than just sort of an isolated academic event. Yeah, I mean, I would hope, I hope that school districts might be interested in talking with me because that's not something I've done um, at all, actually, in my career. I have, you know, colleagues who are doing that and students who are doing a lot of work in, <clears throat> within those nearby school districts. And um, because those narratives are really powerful about those essentialist cultural narratives, are really powerful I mean, among teachers and what they're finding. Um, so challenging them a bit, you know, is difficult. But. Um, and I, I feel like I'm echoing a lot of things, but one additional thing that I wanted to add is earlier when you were talking about the existing literature and the ways in which people talk about like, the immigrant optimism versus the native disillusionment. Mm -hmm. And I think why this is so important is because, like you mentioned, a lot of immigrants or children of immigrants, I even think about my own family immigrated 
and like you know that bootstraps mentality and how that feeds into a lot of like anti-blackness and how this like challenging this is another way of being like it's not necessarily immigrant optimism it's it's all like just the relationship between the ways in which immigrants interact with structural racism so i think exactly. that mm -hmm. this is really important and then thinking about like again like coming from a qualitative interest um like working with immigrant youth like what that means to understand like the um, the contextual attainment, um, but also what that looks like in the American society. So I just yes. I really appreciate writing that. Thank you. Thing to add. Okay. Um, well, Cynthia, uh, thank you for uh, presenting such great work to us. Um, the least we can do is present you with something. Um, so we created this poster to advertise your talk. We do this uh, for all of them in the series. Uh, so we will send you back with this. Uh, we won't make you take it on the plane. Uh, we'll mail it to you. Uh, but it's just a very small token of our appreciation for your contribution to the series and our school. Um, I would like to say for the others who are here, um, the series is a collaboration between the Dean's Office and the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education. Um, so we invite nominations for future scholars of color that you'd like to see uh, be a part of this. Um, the nomination process is very simple. Just send an email either to Dean Grossman <laughs> or to Jesse Harper or me um, with a name. That's all, that's essentially all we need. Um, we can do the Google Intel um, to, uh, to, to find uh, people like Cynthia and others that, that you like to see be a part of the series. Um, I would like to take a moment to uh, thank Mel and uh, Diana uh, Johnson for uh, their work with the uh, series and getting our, our scholars here. And certainly uh, to Dean Grossman for her leadership and great partnership on getting folks like Cynthia uh, here to Penn. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.